very good morning to Daniel Finkelstein, who joins me in the studio. Morning, Danny. Good morning. And beaming in from outer space, it's David Ivanovich. Sorry, are we on yet? <laughs> <laughs> How are you, David? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Now, now, regular listeners will know, I'd like to update on exactly what is on the uh, the sofa behind David when he beams him from home. It's a Ukrainian flag today. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Uh, I ordered uh, a, a couple. I mean, I know it's pathetic and, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's and other people are taking refugees into their houses and so on, but it's it's all I've got. Well, it's, it's nice. It's, it, it brightens up the place, if nothing else. It brightens up the place. That's true. Else. Um, well, let's start today with um, the, the sort of small acts of bravery that we keep seeing from uh, from Ukraine. Well, we've seen lots of them from Ukrainians, but um, this uh, small act of bravery from the Russian journalist. Let's uh, remind ourselves of what happened on the Russian TV channel last night. Let's take a listen. Усилить сотрудничество в рамках союзного государства, а на совещании в правительстве обсуждали, как сохранить. So this is the Russian journalist who hijacked the st uh, state TV news, shouting "No war, stop the war! Don't believe the propaganda!" Holding up a placard. Uh, she is called Marina of. I tried this. Shenikova. No, thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, she recorded a little video, which is, she's released, uh, which she posted on. Uh, on Telegram explaining her opposition to the war and apologising for being part of the uh, the propaganda machine. Uh, this, this, I mean, David, this takes a... That's a huge amount of bravery to do that in Russia, isn't it? I, I, I'm, I don't know whether to be more amazed by the bravery or amazed that it doesn't happen more often, but whichever it is, the fact is we know it's incredibly rare, we know it's incredibly difficult. She gave up in one go her job quite possibly any future job, quite possibly got herself into deep trouble with the authorities. Maybe she'll be in prison, maybe she won't, uh, but that was a risk that she was uh, definitely taken. So she's persona non grata now in one move, just... And imagine her thinking about, I must do this, how am I going to do this? Um, getting that banner together, then the moment where she actually steps forward. It, it, it's fantastically courageous. Now, of course, it's a courage that can work both ways because people can do these things for causes that we don't necessarily uh, support. So, uh, so what we're really talking about is the bravery it, it takes to be a dissenter in a society that is increasingly authoritarian, where the odds are stacked against you. And, of course, it has you wondering, as these things always does, would I do that? You know, under the same circumstances, would I have the courage to do that, the moral fortitude to do that, uh, uh, and so on. But um, And the other thing, of course, that it reminds you is, and it, re it bears repetition. I mean, um, there's, there's a, a site on Twitter, which is um, a, a very, very useful information site, but it has been taking from the Russian press the, um, the obituaries um, and the names of Russian soldiers killed in Ukraine. Um, and you see this parade quite often of incredibly young men, uh, no older than Danny's sons, uh, uh, his two older sons, for example, some of them, who are dying in this struggle because of what, in this in this invasion because of what Putin decided. Um, and you have to remind yourself that we don't hate Russians. We really hate Putin. That's a good. Uh, it's a good point. Um, uh... Danny, but sorry, from David, but Danny, that question of you always think, would I do the same thing? And I suppose you, yeah. of course, writing your book, you're presumably coming across lots of these yeah. small acts of bravery and, and those incidences where you think, would I do the same thing? Yes, I do. Um, I certainly, you know, look at when my grandfather's, um, he had a meeting with Goering at one point and, you know, I had to tell the Jewish community that Goering was saying he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't harm any Jews and my grandfather then printed that on the front page of the Jewish newspaper and um, Goering as a result basically they chased him out of the country um, and so um, yes you do wonder about uh, whether you'd show that kind of courage yourself I, I, I become I'm very obsessed with Martin Luther King just because um, the more that you read about and the more obvious it was that he must have known that eventually someone would kill him uh, and for him to carry mm. on um, campaigning uh, was fascinating. The other thing that was fascinating, and I, I wonder what it will be the case in her case, 
uh, is lots of people might show the courage if it was up to them. But it's often not just up to them. The problem is they've also got families. Yeah. yeah. Um, they've got communities. So, for example, lots of churches, um, African-American churches, didn't like what um, Martin Luther King's movement was doing because it made life difficult for them. It's understandable, but it means that, you know, it's not just yourself you have to think about. Uh, and and it also brings another angle, I think, to the whole oligarch issue. Uh, I was told yesterday about somebody who had opposed the Putin regime and was basically told you have to sell up in seven days and get out of the country. Um, and lots of these um, wealthy people in, um, in Russia are... <clears throat> you know, not capable or not in a position to show the courage that this uh, lady showed. And she's uh, been an example to everybody, I think. You know, I'd love to believe that in those circumstances I'd show that kind of courage, but I think it would be, um, you know, it would be outrageous to say I would because you just don't know, do you? There's also something, David, about your Martin Luther Kings. You know, by the, po by the time he was doing what he was doing. He had a place in history. He was a high-profile person. You know, the, making this decision to do that actually is is such a... It's a you know, the, the risk versus impact versus... Yeah. You know, the risk versus effect. The personal jeopardy versus overall impact. That's true. It's also... It's so um, much worse for her personally than the impact it might have ultimately. It's, it's also... It, 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 it's also... And this is the thing that really strikes me. It's incredibly lonely what she did. That's my, Yes, that's what I mean. It's, um, a, it's, a, it's yeah, a, Exactly. It's so a there's solo no, act. It's not as if there's a kind of great movement. It's not as if she went out of that door <laughs> into the arms of a cheering crowd. You know, she went back and waited for the knock on the door is what uh, is what happened to her. Um, in that sense, what you're looking at uh, much more at is the lonely dissident in something like 1984, to, uh, to, to use that book uh, yet again. Um, it's a courage which may very well, as far as you know, never be rewarded, not be at all successful, um, and which won't lead to any anything but major disadvantage and, and maybe worse for you. Yeah. And it's that's why I find it so really astonishing. And of course, it's not just astonishing, but by drawing attention to it, we we are drawing attention to the better side uh, yeah. of things. It's a bit like the people queuing up uh, because they want to take Ukrainian refugees. Have always been. Uh, particularly religious groups and others who've been very keen, but not just religious groups, who, who, who've offered them their homes, etc., to other people. But they haven't done it in uh, as recognition and rewards. It's always going to kind of be difficult. It's it's good to hold that up, even if it's a small minority of people, because it it, it just uh, it just suggests to us a better way of being. Uh, really, uh, I, I agree. Uh, if if I can recommend to listeners Natan Sharansky's book *Fear No Evil*, it's about his period as a dissident in the Soviet Union. There's an amazing story in it. He's being interviewed by the KGB, and they try to show him pictures of his wife demonstrating outside an embassy in London, shown on Granada television, and they wanted to show it to him as an example that he. He was a spy to show him that he was a spy <laughs> but he hadn't seen his wife for years and so he watched this video and then he said I, I didn't really get that I can't understand English can you show it to me again so they then played it a second time but when he asked to play it a third time just to see his wife after all these years the man <laughs> said to him the man said to him uh, I, I see what you're trying to do uh, you think these people will save you but they are just housewives and students and we are the KGB and he told this story when he visited, as a minister in the government, um, his uh, former KGB cell, uh, ultimately having triumphed. So the only hope we can have is that these kind of uh, lonely uh, people who were arrested will one day uh, be he history's heroes. But unfortunately, we're at the stage of the conflict where we can't guarantee that. Yeah, we don't know. Well, um, D David, you mentioned the, um, uh, the the number of people coming forward to, to open up to, to refugees. Let's just take a listen to uh, Michael Gove in the House of Commons yesterday. I'm going to disagree politically and all the rest of it, but I've just had it up to here with people trying to suggest that this country is not generous. And all this stuff about hostile environment... The hostile environment was invented under a Labour Home Secretary. So can we just chuck it when it comes to the partisan nonsense and get on with delivery? 
So, so we'll overlook the let's have less partisan nonsense, but it was definitely your Labour's fault, uh, briefly. <laughs> uh, Leo, Leo, uh, listener Leo has been in touch saying, uh, after Brexit, I was disheartened the UK being portrayed as interested and unwelcome, especially towards Europeans. But the public response to Ukrainian refugees has restored my faith and hope in British decency and compassion. Do Finkelvich agree? Danny. I don't think we're doing enough. Um, there was a very, very interesting uh, thread by uh, Jonathan Friedland, uh, the Guardian columnist, the other day and about the kinder transport. And what he was pointing out is the reason why the kinder transport was a kinder transport was because we wouldn't take adults. Um, and um, uh, and I thought, yes, very good point. And if you look at, you know, if you said you talked about the work I was doing on my parents and one of the conclusions is, you know, they were shopping for any kind of documentation anywhere in the world. And ultimately what freed them was, um, you know, uh, effectively a sort of fake document from Paraguay, a country that was only willing to support that document, provided my, my mother didn't go there, right? Uh, so um, this problem that refugees find nowhere to go uh, is, uh, you know, a universal of history. Uh, it's, it's obvious that we've been much too slow. It does seem to be changing now. Um, but, but my feeling on that is that um, Michael's pugnacity um, was at variance really with the government's effectiveness on this and I think they haven't been quick enough and they haven't been with the public mood. Most people are for some sort of controlled immigration, um, precisely so that the United Kingdom can be generous in emergencies like this um, where people are fleeing for their lives. Um, by the way, mostly they won't come here, they're going to go to Poland, they, they want to go back to Ukraine. Um, my father came here, my grandfather. They, all their letters was, no, we want to go home yeah. at the end of the war. They couldn't. And, and that's the thing that actually, David, if you're going to be completely cynical, which occasionally I am, a, an enormously open, generous offer from the British government would not lead to massive numbers. So you could afford to appear overly generous and still not be overwhelmed, in the words of critics, uh, because ultimately we're quite a long way from Ukraine, um, the people have got more family ties yeah. with other used to pe Eastern European countries. And instead, we've ended up looking a bit sort of oh, mean-spirited. Let's be clear about this. The government was pushed into this, kicking and screaming all the way. Uh, and I I mean, I like Michael Gove personally, but I thought that performance in the Commons was ridiculous. It's six days ago since Grant Shapps went on a radio outlet saying we shouldn't be taking more refugees because President Zelensky has asked us not to. He actually said that. Um, you know, and to try and pretend he wasn't saying that and to pretend it wasn't incredibly limited and to, and to pretend it hasn't taken ages even to get to uh, to this kind of particular point. And of course, you're right, you know, there, there still will be relatively uh, uh, limited numbers and there's still a big difficulty. But the fact is, this government has to be forced into And uh, his, his non-partisan partisan point, well, those of us who said that Britain does not have this great record of generosity, and by the way, Danny, John, I'm glad that Jonathan Friedland also wrote what I wrote in my column last week about the kinder transport. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alarmed you didn't notice it. But... <laughs> oh dear, this but is still, awkward. I forgot still, that you wrote that. No, 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 that's all, that's all right, Danny. He probably did it better. Well, when, uh, yeah, he did, he did, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> probably, uh, but I also, I mean, the other thing that is also worth remembering is that... Um, Everyone talking about, everyone asking politicians now, are you going to open up your spare bedroom, is completely distracted from the fact that only about one in four, one in five people who've actually applied to come here uh, through the family reunion scheme, which actually is a total nightmare, is everything I can tell. You know, we've had listeners who are trying to get family. The actual people who do want to come here to reunite with family members, um, that's still incredibly complicated, incredibly slow. Um, but we're not talking about that anymore because now we're asking, are you going to open up Chevening and Buckingham Palace? So is it a diversionary tactic uh it's it's probably worked quite well for the government um uh even if uh, it hasn't actually helped anyone uh in the process right let's now turn our attention to what happened in the house of lords last night My Lord. My Lord, um, i wanted to take part in this debate because uh, for, i state my position as somebody who is a um a remainer but if there's two things that i welcome in coming out of the common market. One is the CAP and this particular um, gene editing. I'm sorry, but the noble lord was fast asleep for the entire duration of the minister's speech. He really should not participate in this debate, having failed to take, take advantage of the ability to hear it. 
I'm afraid the noble lord was fast asleep for the entirety of the minister's um, opening speech. Well, I had to send a note to you in order to wake you up by the doorkeeper. So, Daniel Finkelstein. Uh, Lord Finkelstein, if you please. How many times have you been sent a note telling you to wake no, up? Never. The reason this has happened is that everyone in the House of Lords is very sensitive about this because of the reputation that yeah, everyone yeah. has at the House of Lords. So, therefore, it's regarded as a really big faux pas. I feel very sorry for um, Lord John of Normal Green, who's actually a very assiduous contributor, hard worker in the House of Lords, so it's a bit of a shame that it should be him. But I have fallen asleep once in the House of Commons, weirdly enough. I went to watch um, the uh, uh, Treasury questions, I think, in the, in the gallery up above, and I fell asleep there, and it got into actually one of the sketches. It was very embarrassing. And obviously, you can't <laughs> control it particularly. But, but, I, but I, you know, I think it's correct that the House of Lords should regard this as you know, a matter of propriety, because you are there to, you know, to pay attention and engage in the detail of the debate. And if you're not paying attention, then you can't do that. So I, 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 I do see why it happened. The worst occasion I've had for failing to pay attention to something was when Brian McWinney had gone, uh, the Ch Conservative Party chairman for whom I worked, had gone on a Today programme. I hadn't listened to it because I was driving in or something anyway, or I was on the tube. I bumped into him and he goes, uh, did you hear that? And he's quite, he was quite a sort of in-your-face character. And I, before I knew what I'd said, I said, oh, yes, I hadn't actually heard it. And he goes, did, did, how do you think it went? So, that was done. <laughs> so I said, I said uh, oh, it was, it was fine, no, no problem at all, because I couldn't say anything else. And I then felt worse. Anyway, it turned out to have been a total disaster. He'd got into an argument with the presenter. It was sort of one of those things that went on for three days, a famous <laughs> argument. You know? And I'd, of course, committed myself in the first 10 minutes to his side of the, uh, of the story, which was incredibly, it got increasingly embarrassing as the days went on. And so it was a real lesson to me now. I never, ever do that. If someone says, have you heard something? Something or read something like David's column, for example. Uh, <laughs> I'm completely honest. <laughs> Do you know? Weirdly, actually, if you'd have asked me whether I'd read that, I would have said yes. I'm pretty sure I did because I'm. We were always having a discussion about You're this. Not subject. making this any better. Dan. No, no, no. I can't. I, I can't have. <laughs> read have you that, ever? Have you ever read his column? Do, always, do you know who he is? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, everyone, uh, readers, please always read David's column. I never, I, I clearly this isn't true what I'm about to say, but I never miss it. <laughs> uh, David, what do you? Have you ever fallen asleep somewhere you shouldn't? Maybe reading one uh, of Daddy's no, columns. No, but, look, but, but look, all of us do publications, <laughs> and we all know that we do publications, and we can be as exciting as you like. There's always somebody there asleep. Yeah. Always. There's always somebody. You can do a thing with eight people and one of them's asleep. You can do a thing with 300 people and somebody in the third row is asleep. Some people come to events simply to go to sleep. They find it, so they find it soothing. I do not see for the life of me why listening to a minister's boring speech should be a precondition for taking part in a debate. <laughs> I well, think you should be allowed no. to fall well, asleep. I mean, I no, it's to be polite. I suppose if you're you going to debate... In the hall of the House of Lords. You're, su you you're supposed to engage with the argument. If you're, the Lords, if you're going to different. debate what the minister said, you should at least possibly yeah. have heard that, what the minister you're, said. You're, you're, you don't, you're not necessarily just debating what the minister says. You have you, a viewpoint on a particular thing. You know what the minister's going to say. That is the Lord's... That, that's, that's the thing the of the Lords. That's the Lords. When you... You'll learn all this, David, when you finally get given the goal. Put it in your next column. I can ignore it. When you... Lovely stuff, lovely stuff. In fact, a woman on the front row in the show in Chorley uh, was asleep on her husband's shoulder for almost the entire two-hour show on Saturday night. Everyone else seemed to enjoy it, though. Uh, lovely stuff. That was Finkovich, Daniel Finkelstein and David Aronovich. You can read them both in The Times. You want to do this, Danny? Go to thetimes.co.uk, sign up now, and you can read David's column. Uh, lovely stuff. Uh, they'll be back same time next week.